Okay. Recording is on. C'est bon. Right. Great. Donc, euh, merci Alassane d'être euh, là pour notre toute première session. Euh, donc, euh, je vais vous présenter Alassane très rapidement. Donc, Alassane est CEO et cofondateur de Widou.ai. Euh, il est aussi étudiant euh, Avant ça, il a fait Ems Cameroun. Il est aussi ancien de, du National Advanced School of Engineering Douala. Euh, Alassane est aussi ambassadeur Zindi. Il a été jusqu'à... Je pense qu'il est toujours d'ailleurs. Euh, il a aussi quelques publications à son nom, donc uh, Application of Object Detection in Robotics Case Study, Keep and Place Car Robot Arm. Uh, il y a le Makerere Special Fluid Disease Detection Using Faster RCNA, entre autres. Donc il a aussi reçu le troisième prix de Microsoft Data Science Hackathon, donc uh, Zindi, en avril 2021. Donc, euh, sans plus tarder, je laisse la parole à Alassane. Tu peux continuer à t'introduire si tu veux rajouter des choses. <laughs> non, non, c'est bon. <laughs> OK. So, uh, I'll be doing the presentation in English. If that doesn't, if no one has a concern with that. And thank you, Mr. Ismail, for giving me the floor. Uh, today, presentation, uh, or today, re paper reading, <coughs> I'll present to you Bird topic, a topic modeling model, a neural topic modeling with a class-based TF-IDF procedure. But before going into the presentation, I would like to briefly talk about what actually is topic modeling with a practical example. So imagine you have a, a group of documents and like you don't have the idea of the origin of those documents or where you can classify this document so basically topic modeling is a kind of unsupervised machine learning approach that makes you uh, group together different documents into various topics so now uh, researchers up to now have come up with very brilliant ideas on how to do this uh technique of modeling and today we are looking at one of these techniques and one of the most uh, used case which is bird topic that has something like 53,000 downloads in yogin hugging face and that is very applicable in different fields uh including uh, text retrieval um keyword search in uh, text uh, documents and much more so today i will present to you like the workflow of how the author uh, called martin Rutel's dot was able to extract oh, or yeah. to model these different topics uh, using uh, bad topic the idea he used here is Uh, Alison, we are not hearing you. You can unmute yourself, please. Now I'm muted. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Yes, it's okay. okay. Yes, it's okay now. So where did I stop? I was talking about um, the main idea the auto use, and I was talking about Martin Gutendorf. The idea he used here is actually to uh, convert a set of documents, and the documents in this case are sentences, into embeddings before performing any clusterization of this document in order to look for the semantic similarity between each document and their respective topic. So the idea is just to group the documents or the sentences into different topics, and the topics here are classes. But now, now uh, during the previous research, uh, most of the research did not come into uh, account with BERT model or protein language model. And actually protein language model are a very good start or a state of art model that we use now to retrieve information, semantic information from different documents in order to study their similarities and therefore grouping them together. So. The idea is actually to use those protein language models to extract embedding from the sentences, grouping them together using some clustering technique that we will see later. 
and then define a topic based on a variant of the TFIDF uh, 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 technique used most mainly in word embeddings or word word to vec embeddings, something like that. So I will walk through the different approach used in the past and now that have been used here and compare the different approach and show you how the the modeling technique was used to have a state of art model called bed topic. So as an introduction, the most used technique that was so far uh, utilized this uh, the, for the past, during the past was Latin Jewishly allocation. And Latin Jewishly allocation is actually a stochastic model that tried to model a distribution between topics and documents as well as documents and word. Let me take a simple example. So imagine you have a document, which is actually a sentence, for example, and we have, let's say, key topics. Consider topics as classes. So what we do is that for a document, we have different set of words. And in Latin English allocation, what we do is we allocate a specific topic to each word in the document. And now based in a Jewishly distribution, we are able to extract or to, to, to model the frequency of appearance of a word in a document, such that a Latin topic is a linear combination of the frequency of a word and that word. So basically, the more a word appear in a document, the more likely it is representative of a class or a topic of that document. So that was the most used approach so far, and it's actually used as a benchmark model when we are working on topic modeling in order to do maybe comparative analysis. But now a problem arises with this kind of modeling technique, and that problem is actually at the level of the back of word assumption. So basically, in Latin digital allocation, what happens is that we assume the words in a document to be just back of words. And now since we are using back of word, we cannot capture the semantic similarity between these words in order to model the topic. And actually the core concept of topic modeling is to capture these semantic similarities in order to define a topic uh, in, a, in a group of documents, for example. So for this reason, some other researchers came with an idea of actually using embedding techniques to be able to extract semantic similarities between different group of documents. And I want to still remind that when I talk of document, I talk of, let's say, sentences. So in order to look for the semantic similarity between a group of sentences, we use uh, a pre-trained language model and some clustering techniques in order to do that. So to mitigate the back of word assumption, uh, the researchers use word embedding before even going to protein language model, they use word embedding. For example, CIL use top to vec, like uh, a definition of the embedding of a topic in a group of document in order to model the, the topic on its own. And how does it work? Actually, in a group of word, we can model a topic as a linear combination of the embedding of those words. So what happens is we take into consideration the embedding of each word to define a topic. And now a topic can be defined as the centroid of the combination of the word in a group or in a class. So if you have a group of documents, we perform a clustering technique on it. Then we define a linear combination of those words to define a topic. Like, for example, the mean of the vectors of those words to define a topic. So that topic now is the center of these different words. And now a topic will be characterized as selecting the word that are closely associated or closely related to that topic. When I talk of closely, yeah, I talk of a distance metric, for example, let's say cosine similarity, or let's say, for example, an equation distance between the center of the cluster and the words uh, surrounding the cluster. So the more close a word is to the central of the cluster, the more likely that that word is a representation of the topic that defines the cluster. But still, there's a problem with this kind of approach because clusters are not uh, 
always uh, uh, circular or spheric in nature. So this could not actually uh, define the distribution of a word in, in a topic. For this reason, uh, the researchers came up with other ideas that actually use embedding that can capture the similarities of the different documents. And here we talk of uh, uh, bet bidirectional encoder representation for transformation in order to extract the embeddings of a document, cluster those embedding, and now extract these uh, words that represent the topic using TFIDF. So that is the basic or the main idea that we use in bed topic as a workflow. So, and that is the problem that bed topic tried to mitigate. Firstly, the centroid assumption of clusters, and secondly, the back of word assumption of Latin divisional allocation. So, how does this work? So, basically, the closing can be done using HDB scan, but later I will show you or I will describe the different approach that the author used in order to perform the clustering and what he did before even performing the clustering and why he did so. So, moving to the next part of the paper. So the related work associated to topic modeling and as a whole, it all started with Nuhal topic modeling. Uh, and Nuhal topic modeling is simply uh, defining uh, a topic using a Nuhal network, for example. And it came up with the idea of word to vec. So the first thing was maybe to transform the word into an embedding before performing any modeling of the topic, either using Latin Jewish allocation, for example, proposed by uh, La Rochelle and Loli, or using a clustering technique proposed by maybe Sia et Al, and now with Martin Gutenstorff. So with, with the new topic modeling approach, we extract the embeddings, we perform Latin Jewish allocation, or we perform uh, a clustering technique in order to group the similar topics or the similar documents together before extracting any topic from it. So that is the idea that uh, we are using here in bed topic. But now the flow of bed topic is as follows. We have the words, the documents. We extract the embedding from the documents using a transformer. And in this case, we are using sentence bed to extract a document. And the reason why we are to extract embedding, sorry, and the reason why we are using sentence bed is actually to have those uh, that semantic similarity to mitigate the problem of back of word assumption before performing the clustering. The clustering here is done using UMAP, uh, and the, the the clustering is done using uh, uh, SGB scan, sorry. And before that, the clustering the embeddings are uh, lowered in dimension using UMAP. But now, the reason why we are using UMAP to perform the dimension lowering is actually because at higher dimension, the words that we transform into embeddings may have similar uh, distance metric. Like in a high dimension, the embeddings will not be, uh, will not be able to locate or to be to distinguish between two pair of words. So what we can do is we can lower the dimension while maintaining the local structure of the embeddings. By so doing, the most prominent uh, approach used so far is UMAP. So with UMAP, we lower the dimension, and now we perform the clustering using HGB scan, again, to maintain the, the local structure of the, of the embedding and the similarity between the different set of embeddings. Now, the reason why we actually perform dimensionality reduction is because there is a very serious problem with uh, word embedding extracted from transformers. And that problem is because the embedding space in which the pre-trained language model, not only transformers, pre language models are obtained is at the level of a conline, conline uh, space. So the embeddings are not uh, dispersed or spread out together, making it 
very close in the space. So it's an anisotropic space where the embeddings are grouped together. Even though maybe the embeddings will not be like similar enough, but if you try to compute the cosine similarity between these two sets of embeddings, the similarity will be very big. So for this reason, we want to transform that anisotropic subspace into an isotropic space. And for this reason, that's the reason why we want to uh, extract or we lower the dimension so that we can be able to, first of all, mitigate the problem of dimensionality, uh, the dimensionality space, like it's a very big space. And also because you want to uh, reduce the anisotropy of the embedded space uh, used with pre-trained language models. So what I'm saying actually is that we cannot or we should not use the embedding extracted directly from the transformers. The reason why I say so is because the embedding space of transformers is cone-like in nature. So it means that the embedding of each word extracted from a transformer are so close together that if we compute the cosine similarity between two sets of embedding in extracted from a transformer, it will be very right, even if the words are not that similar. So it is better for us to convert the answer space into an isotropic space in order to perform the, the clustering. If we just cluster based on an isotropic subspace, then we could have a lot of random noise. So that is the reason why here we should transform the subspace into an isotropic space where we can actually distinguish between similar words and dissimilar words. But we should also maintain the semantic similarity between each word. But here, the particularity of bed topic is that it doesn't perform uh, uh, word embeddings on the tokens of the words in a document, but it actually performs word embeddings on the document as a whole. So if I have a sentence, I will extract the words, the, I mean, I will extract the embedding from the sentence as a whole before performing any clustering of the embedding. And in order to extract this embedding, uh, in section 3.1, the author proposed sentence bed, but actually we can use any kind of pretrained language model to extract the embedding, provided the pretrained language uh, model has been trained in order to actually extract the similarity between different set of documents in our case. So the, the, the author uses sentence bed to extract the embeddings. So it means that what the embeddings, if you use different a different pre language model, the embedding could have a different dimensions. So here we use sentence bed. Now, in order to perform document closing in section 3.2, as I earlier said, uh, we, we lower down the dimension of the embedding that we extracted from sentence bed in order to mitigate the the, the uh, how can I say that, that anisotropic subspace. So we cannot compute, we, if we compute the distance between each words in the, uh, each, each document uh, embedding, it will be very small because they are close together because the space is cone-like in nature. So to mitigate it, we use UMAP as I earlier said. So UMAP will lower down the dimension and it will maintain the local structure of the different document embeddings. UMAP is based on a graph, a graph uh, structured approach or graph uh, machine learning approach, just like TSNI. But now the dimension is lower, but the structure of the embedding is maintained. So after performing this uh, dimension reduction using UMAP, we perform the clustering using HGB scan. So the idea of HGB scan is actually to uh, do a kind of hierarchical clustering approach based on the density of the word. So what I actually mean by density is that uh, very close words or very close document in our case will be considered as a cluster. And the particularity of HGB scan is that if it's not able to cluster a particular document or a particular word, you will consider it as an outlier. So HGB scan is actually a very good approach to perform the clustering as proposed or as uh, defined by Alwe et al, which, which actually said the HGB scan can be used to detect both outliers and also to perform the, the clustering technique. So now we have accepted the embeddings, we have lowered the dimension of the embeddings, 
we want to do the, we have done the cl clustering uh, technique using HDB scan, but now how can a document or a word in a document uh, define the distribution of a topic? For this reason, the author came up with an idea that he derived from uh, TFIDF, topic representation, uh, as presented in uh, section 3.3. .3. So the idea was how does a word impact the distribution of a topic? This can be done using TFIDF. So basically, TFIDF is a combination of two terms. The first term being the term frequency, and the second term being the inverse document frequency. The term frequency actually measures the, the number of words for a given word, let's say T, the number of words that appear in a document D. That's the term frequency. Now, the inverse uh, document frequency actually computes the ratio between the number of documents divided by the total number of documents that contains the word. So this is the global definition of TFIDF. But now how can we transform it into an approach that we can use as a cluster-based TFIDF? So remember, we have, at this level, we have different clusters or different topics. Consider a topic as a cluster. Now, in order to look at how representative a word is to a cluster or to a topic, what we actually do is we compute the term frequency of a word in a cluster, which we multiply by a variant of the inverse document frequency. The term frequency actually in a cluster represents the number of words, the, 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 the frequency of the word that appear in that cluster. And the inverse document frequency or the variant of the inverse document frequency as defined in equation two represents the ratio between the average number of words in all the documents I mean, in all the topics or in all the clusters, divided by the total number of words or total number of documents that appear in uh, the total number of documents in which the word appear in. So it is defined in equation two. So A here represents the average number of words in all the topics. So let's say you have K topics, and let's say uh, each topic has 10,000 words. So the average number of words will be the sum of the 10,000 words divided by K, for example, which will still be 10,000. And now the term frequency uh, of the word will be the total number of documents that contains the word throughout the entire cluster, or the total number of, uh, of the, total, the, the frequency, the total number of, of words that appear in, the, in, each, in all the clusters as a whole. So we have two terms, the first one being the frequency of word in the cluster. And the second one is the frequency of word in all the clusters. And A here represents the average number of words in all the clusters. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but we will later discuss about it. And that is exactly how uh, we use the cluster. It's a variance of the TFIDF, but at a cluster level. So that's why we talk of a cluster-based TFIDF. But now the author did not stop there. And in section four, he defined a way of dynamically model a topic. So when I talk of dynamic topic modeling here, it is similar to topic modeling, but to an extent where we add time step, like it is a time-based topic modeling. So the idea behind time-based topic modeling is actually to see how each word vary across time. So in a given topic, let's say topic K, we have a word like car, Tesla, and let's say uh, truck. Maybe in 1990, this is how a, a vehicles were defined. We have, let's say, okay, let's say car and truck. But now in 2010, it is defined as car and Tesla. Why? Because Tesla is actually a, one of the companies that can build these cars. So we want to see how these words vary across time and probably see the words that are invariant across time in order to define the trajectory of a, of a topic over a time. So this is actually done. It can be uh, done using Latin Jewish layer approach, but using that topic, it is almost similar, but it is just that at this particular level, we introduce time step. So in section four, and equation three, the 
third term that we used here is I, the, ter the term I here define the, the time step at which we define a particular word in a topic. So just imagine that same cluster, but the words or the documents are now binded at different time steps so that we can model a topic at those different time steps. So in a cluster, for example, at, at maybe year 2006, we may have uh, words like car, truck, and in 2010, we may have a word like car, Tesla. We may have an, another topic like maybe Google and Facebook. But in 2020, we have DeepMind, OpenAI, and so on. So we want to model how these words or this topic vary across time. But now, if we move to section 4.1, there's a particular problem when modeling dynamic topic modeling. The problem is at the level of the smoothing. Naturally, different topic models are, are derived based on a linear assumption. The linear assumption is that at a particular topic, we have uh, a linear, linear relationship between different set of words in a topic. So like I earlier said for dynamic topic modeling, let's say car and truck, and now we have car and Tesla. There should be a linear relationship between the car and truck defined maybe at year 2006 and the car and Tesla defined in 2010. But unfortunately, when performing topic modeling with bad topic, there was some, some kind of uh, noise when modeling these different topics at different time steps. So the author came with an idea of smoothing the technique. So how do we perform the smoothing? The IDF or the, the term frequency and the inverse term frequency is globally defined for the entire documents in a particular topic. And now, we use a kind of L1 norm here that we highlight here, an L1 norm that we use to uh, normalize the different uh, TF IDF that we obtain for a particular topic. And now, for a different time steps, we try to compute like the mean of the previous IDF at let's say time t minus one, and the IDF at let's say time t and we average it so that we have a linear relationship. So basically, the idea will be something like, um, I will write an equation here for you to see. So a topic now will be defined as, let's say the topic of that word at time t minus one, plus the, top, the word at that topic at time t divided by two, in order to maintain a linear relationship between the word that are model at different time steps. So this is how he overcome the smooth the the noise provided when we perform the topic the topic modeling dynamically like at different time step. So now topic of talking of the experimental setup in section five, the author use three data sets mainly three main three main data sets. Uh, we have the twenty news group data set. We have the BBC News and the Trump Street. Uh, let me just describe briefly, for example, the 20 news group that I said, where we have actually 16,309 reviews of different, uh, uh, let's say, articles that are that are have 20 categories. Some are talking about religions, another are talking about um, health, another are talking about food, and so on and so forth. And now, we assume that those top, those documents does not have like a particular uh, category because I earlier said that topic modeling is actually an unsupervised approach. So we assume randomly that we have different kind of, um, we have different documents and we want to perform the clustering technique in order to see the different topics that we can uh, obtain from them. So we have the 20 news group that I said that we use for the normal topic modeling approach but now we have the tweets, the, the Donald Trump tweet that I said that we use for the dynamic topic modeling approach. So now to compare uh, the topic modeling technique, uh, bare topic in section 5.2, the author used the Latin digital allocation LDA as a base, a benchmark model to actually compare. He also used top to vec as one of the models to uh model 
different topics. He also used NMF, uh, uh, normal maximal uh, factorization, as also a benchmark to perform a topic modeling. But now, uh, models like top 2 vec uh, and uh, CTM use this uh, uh, word embeddings. So to make the comparison fair, bare topic as well as uh, top to vec and CTM were extracted, the MAD were extracted using the same uh, model, putting language model, which is a sentence bed. And now we perform the, the, the topic modeling technique for each of these different models as seen in table one. And we will come to it later because I want, first of all, to define the evaluation technique used for this topic modeling approach. So we perform the the embedding extraction, as I said, using sentence bed. We lower the dimension using UMAP, and then we perform the clustering using HGB scan. Now, talking of the evaluation, we use topic diversity and topic coherence in order to perform uh, the evaluation of the different topic model. So topic diversity and topic coherence are the most famous uh, metrics used when we are you working with either topic modeling or topic discovery that we later uh, define. And topic coherence actually is a measure of the normalized uh, point-wise mutual information between a set of words. So maybe I will write something about the, the point-wise mutual information. So I don't know if you can see the small text that I'm... Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, so basically what happened is that if we have, for a topic K, we have different set of words. Sorry about the noise, it's actually raining here. So we have different words, let's say word one, word two, and so on, up to let's say word N. So in order to model a topic coherence between this set of words, what we are actually doing is we compute the point-wise mutual information by doing what? By calculating the probability between the occurrence of the word one, let's say, and word two, divided by the divided by the independence occurrence of each of these words. Let's say word one times word two. Something like this. Basic this is the basic idea. So we 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 compute the probability of the co-occurrence between word one and word two, and we compute the probability of the occurrence of each of these words. And actually, the uh, probability of co-occurrence of word one to word two, let's say, is computed using the. It's just a. It's just a counting technique. We count the number of document, let's say D, that contain both W one and W two, like word one and word two divided by the total number of documents, let's say in a topic. Let's say, let me call it DF. And we do the same for, uh, let's say, uh, the probability of word one. So we count the number of documents that con contain the uh, word one divided by the total number of documents. So with this approach, we are able to model the topic coherence between each word. The topic coherence actually, uh, to a human point of view, just study the similarity between the different words, like actually to see if the words are actually coherent. So if you model a topic, let's say, of food, you may expect to see, let's say, cheeseburger, sandwich. And you see, if you have a word like car, then there will be this kind of, it's kind of a, a problem for this uh, modeling technique. So that is why we use topic uh, coherence in order to see actually if the word that we have modeled are coherent to the topic. Now we also use topic di diversity. Topic diversity actually sees how vary how the different words vary across the topics. So if you have, let's say two topics, topic one and topic two, we are expecting to see maybe topic one modeling, let's say food, like I said, cheeseburger and sandwich and all the rest. And topic two model, something like car, Tesla, uh, production and so on. So if it comes, it once comes that in topic two, you see also cheeseburger and something like that, then that's also a problem. It means the, the topic modeling technique is not uh, as quite good as we were expecting. So the topic coherence 
is a metric that varies between zero and one, where, uh, I mean, negative one and one, where negative one means it's not really coherent, and one is like the best coherence you can have so far. And the topic diversity varies from zero to one, with zero meaning that there's a redundancy in the different topics, like the topics are actually very similar, and one meaning that the topics are actually very diverse, like one topic defines a particular set of words, another topic defines another set of words, and so on and so forth. So if I'm coming back to table one, uh, you will notice that for the different uh, modeling techniques, uh, we have highlighted, or the author have highlighted the different scores of the topic model. And for some of them, like uh, uh, bad topic MPNET, we can actually see that it is performing very well, despite the fact that to an extent, the talk to vec approach is kind of better than it. But to, in a more general case, it is good in modeling the, the topic. The author did not stop here, but he actually tried to study how uh, um, the speed of computing of these different topics. So he tried to study the runtime of the of the different models used so far. So for the next um, section, section six, for the results, we start by studying, first of all, the stability of bad topic. So he used different variants of bad topic one with doc to vec one with protein language model in this case sentence bed let's say with mean mini lm and uh, with use and actually the model topic or the topic coherence is actually very close and very good as well as the topic diversity so um for the different uh, dynamic topic model as defined in section 6.3 we use uh, the trom data set in order to model the topic and still using the same uh, metric like the topic coherence and the topic diversity we can actually see that the bed topic is very good in modeling the the topic as well as in terms of topic coherence and topic diversity now the bed topic evolve if you remember i defined a or i discussed about a variant of bare topic which consider a linear relationship between different set of word model at different time steps. So that is actually bare topic evolved and it also performs very well as far as topic modeling is concerned. So for the section 6.4, uh, the world time computing, where we actually want to compute the, the speed up of the different topics model. So here we have different variants of topics going from bare topic till uh, uh, Latin digital allocation or normal maximal factorization, we can see that the words or the in figure one of for sure, the, the topic or the model defined by top to vec or doc to vec has a very slow uh, runtime complexity. Well, let me say a big runtime complexity. And that's why the curve actually kick off from the, the rest of the other curves. So if we try to remove this curve and we want to, let's say, explore uh, consequently the, the, the closer curves together, defining the second part of the figure, we actually see that um, bed topic has a significant good runtime complexity. And this, the idea, the reason why we actually study this different time complexity technique is because we want to know which embedding we can use to model a particular topic based on the problem. So as you can see on the x-axis, we have the vocabulary size that keeps on increasing. And for sure, if the vocabulary size increase, then the modeling technique will actually increase as well. So which technique or which model can we use to maybe have a good topic modeling approach with a reasonable um, runtime complexity with a well-defined data set or vocabulary size? So that's the reason why we, we would like to study this kind of runtime complexity analysis for a different topic model. Uh, for the, the talking of discussion in section seven, bed topic is actually a very good technique to model the, diff a, the representation of words in a particular topic. And based on this different experimental setup, it is actually good in representing uh, or defining the different topics in 
the different words or the, the representation of the word in different set of topics. But now, bad topic is not uh, only good, it has also some weakness. And here we, in section 7.1, we can see most of the strength of bad topic. And in 7.2, we look at the weakness. The first strength of bad topic is that it is modularizable. Initially, I've, as I've earlier discussed, I talked about using sentence bed to extract the embeddings from the documents before performing any clustering technique. And I did not limit myself on talking only on sentence bed, meaning that as time goes on, if we define or for sure we will define better protein language models that we can actually use to uh, perform the clustering technique or to extract the embedding from the bed topic. So the idea is it can change over time and it can become better as we have more state-of-the-art language models that will come up for sure. And also it is uh, independent in modeling both um, the words, document distribution and the topic, uh, and a document topic distribution, unlike top to vec that define both the word distribution and the topic distribution in the same embedding space it make it might cause some problem like i like i earlier discussed about the the centroid approach where we want to look for the words that are close to a centroid before defining if those words are representative of a topic in bare topic that's not the case we model both uh, distribution kind of separately so the distribution of documents in a topic can be modeled essentially based on the clustering technique and the distribution of the words in the topic is essentially based on the TFIDF approach or the cluster-based TFIDF for sure. So these are the main uh, strengths of uh, topic bed. But talking of the weakness, one of the weakness of bed topic is that it is not uh, totally based on, on the semantic similarity of the, of the documents because if you notice very well, when performing the clustering, we perform the clustering on the documents because we want to, cop to capture the similarity between the set of documents. But unfortunately, when we are defining a topic, we are using TFIDF. So it is still a back of word approach that we use to model a topic. And this might be a problem. And again, another problem that a uh, bad topic will have is that when looking for the semantic similarity of the document, we take the document as a whole. Whereas a particular document may have different topics. So for example, in a sentence, we can have car, food, and let's say computer science in the same sentence. But now when we are performing the clustering, we, clust we cluster the whole em sentence embedding to perform uh, the topic modeling. So it might cause a problem. One of the approach we can use to mitigate this problem is maybe to, diff to cut off the different documents into smaller tokens that will capture the similarities between the, the set of documents. And now uh, one last uh, weakness of bad topic is it, uh, when modeling the topic or when modeling the, yes, when modeling the topic, we might have words that are redundant to one another. And that's not actually very good to define the topic. For sure, it is good for topic coherence, but it might be bad for topic diversity. As I said, topic diversity, the topic, the word in a topic should be diverse, and the word across the topic as well should be kind of diverse. So one way to mitigate this problem is to use uh, marginal, maximal, uh, 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 let's say, uh, so, uh, supremation, something like this, MMR where we would like to remove uh, dissimilar words from a topic in order to make the topic coherence more strong or more robust and the topic diversity as well more robust. This has actually been implemented with the, by the author, despite the fact that here it defined it as a weakness, but there's actually a library called uh, bad topic where we can define, um, we can use the different techniques or even better techniques that are not defined in this paper to perform a topic modeling. Bad topics actually um, has highly been improved across time because this paper is something that is kind of, let me say, out of date. 
consuming the time, but it has actually very evolved very well. And as a conclusion, this was a very nice technique that the uh, the author brought into into life for a psychologist as uh, with a psychological background. We know machine learning background. It's it's um, kind of uh, awesome to bring this kind of technique uh, to actually cluster a different set of documents embedding before extracting the topics using TFIDF. So what I can actually say about this paper is that simple technique can actually bring very brilliant uh, or astonishing results. And we don't need to maybe think out of the box that much before coming up with with good ideas. We can just maybe derive some techniques from different techniques that already exist and we adapt into the problem that we want to resolve in order to to get the maybe better results or something like that. So uh, as a brief summary of what I've said, what we need to understand from this is that for if we if we want to talk of bad topic, there are some steps that you need to know. The first one is you have the documents, you extract the embedding using a protein language model. Why are we using protein language model? Because we want to capture the semantic similarity between the documents. We perform dimensional reduction. Why are we performing dimensionality reduction? Because we want to mitigate the problem of anisotropy of the uh, protein language model embedding space. So we convert the anisotropic subspace into an isotropic subspace where we can actually distinguish between similar documents and dissimilar documents. We perform a, a, a hierarchical uh, clustering using HDB scan in order to maintain the local structure of the embedding, even in a lower dimension, and also to remove outlier words that are that is word that we cannot model or uh, cluster together. Then finally, we use a cluster-based variant of TF-IDF in order to perform a topic modeling approach. So um, here now we have the references that you might maybe check uh, later. And thank you for your kind attention. I'm open for questions and discussions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much Alata, for this presentation. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. And I'm even thinking about using it in uh, a Kaggle competition, talking about, uh, I think it's learning equality, where you have like, where you can see things as topics yeah. For example, like math and uh, science and yeah. I don't know, different yeah, sure. different people are, are studying and you have to match content. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say given a document, you should, uh, I think given a topic, you should propose what content better fits that, uh, that document. And I think like, it's like a very good uh, idea. I will try to, to use it when I am creating my baseline. Yeah. So okay. thank you. And uh, yeah, you talk about the dimensionality reduction. And uh, so, do you think like uh, there there could be situations where we can use uh, other dimensionality reduction than than you? We, yes, there could be situation where we can use other dimensionality reduction. Uh, okay, here the author was kind of specific because you see the the author wanted to maintain the similarity. Okay, initially the, the assumption the author used is that uh, similar documents have uh, are semantic, semantically similar. So, and in previous work, uh, UMAP was kind of a good approach to perform uh, clustering or, I mean, dimensionality reduction of similar, like similar the, uh, the, the embeddings of by, the Okay, by preserving the, the embeddings, like exactly. similar. Things that are close in high dimension should be also close in the lower dimension. Okay. In the lower dimension, actually, yeah. But mm, I think we can also try with uh, um, PCA, but I I doubt we we need to try. But I doubt we can have good result like with UMAP. Okay. Okay. Mm. Uh, Ismail, you have another question, or can I ask my? Uh, you can you can ask yours and I will come back later. Okay, uh, Alison, thank you for this presentation. Great presentation, by the way. 
Uh, I have a question. Oh, let's say three, two questions. Okay. Mm. The first one is, what is the motiva motivation to use Latin TV credit allocation? Does the type of data a good motivation or the, the main motivation to use this this algorithm? And my second question is related to uh, this. I lost where I wrote the second question. <laughs> Uh, no, so this the second question is you perform LDA before uh, perform the clustering using SD, SDB scan or what is the what what is the workflow to perform the clustering? Ah, uh, okay. So okay, uh, Latin Jewish layer allocation is it was a baseline model. So like you see, when you are working on a you know, on a technique when you come up with a with an idea you would like to compare it with previous work so latin dirish layer allocation is a topic modeling technique that has been used um, that that is very that it has been used uh, frequently uh, over the time and the author wanted to compare bed topic with latin dirish layer allocation so we are not using latin dirish layer allocation to perform any clustering or whatsoever latin dirish layer allocation was a technique on its own and it is based on the Dirichlet distribution. Okay. Like we, we want to model the distribution between a topic and a document and the topic and the word. Okay. At the end of Latin Dirichlet allocation, we have uh, a topic that is represented by a linear combination of the words that appear in that topic. So if you have 10,000 words in a the topic, then the, I mean 10,000 words in uh, let's say in a, in a topic, then this 10,000 word will be representative of the topic, but some words will be more representative than the other. So like you have maybe topic K equals to 0 0.5 times car plus 0 0.02 times food plus 0 0.03 times and so on and so forth. You see that car is more representative of the topic than food. So it's another technique. Okay. Uh, and yes. And uh, of the second question, uh, we perform. Okay, the second question is actually associated to bed topic, not Latin Jewish allocation. And for bed topic, what we do is we extract the. So if we have, we have a document, and I said the document can be a sentence. So we extract the embedding of that document using a pre-trained language model. Um, I would like to say pretty language model because sentence bed is not the only way to extract the embeddings. The only thing you should take into consideration when extracting the embedding is that you need to make sure that the pretty language model you use has been trained to detect similar uh, the word embeddings or document embedding. So that's the reason why the author here use sentence bed. So we extract the embedding using sentence bed. Now, since the embedding has very high dimension, we cannot directly perform clustering on it because the like i said the subspace in which the pre-trained language models embedding are actually found is cone like in nature so it means that you can imagine the structure of a cone so if you put some some things inside the cone then they will be very close together mm -hmm. like and and it will not be representative of the, the similarity or dissimilarity between the different words embedding. So that's the reason why we want to transform that cone-like structure into a space where the the word embeddings are spread up, like maybe using a Gaussian distribution or something like that, mm -hmm. and now compute the similarity between the words and so on. So that we are transforming the anisotropic space into an isotopic space. Then we perform the clustering using HGB scan. And when we use SGB scan, what I said is uh, the, the cluster are created based on the density of the words. So when lowering the dimension of the, um, of the embeddings, what happens is that there will be some structures or some embeddings that are closely related to one another. And so if there's a particular dense region of words that are close together, we can define that word as a cluster. So that's a uh, SGB scan is a density based clustering uh, approach, so that's the reason why we use SGB scan. I don't know if okay. I am answering the question. Yes, yes, totally. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Yes. 
So, like, I, I have a question also. It's about topic currents and topic diversity. Uh, if I understand well, like, the topic currents, it is like I take a class, like I take a topic, which you said you can consider as a class, and we see, like, maybe the, the currents of the different words within that topic. Yes. So yes. we can say that it's just like measuring how similar documents within a topic are, and then yes. the topic diversity is the opposite. Like I take documents from different different topics, and I yes. compute how dissimilar they are. Exactly. In both cases, mm -hmm. like in both cases, higher is is better, right? Yes, in both cases, higher is better. Okay, higher because better. Um, I I think in in one of the tales, like uh, we we see that bird topic is is doing better if we consider both of them i think than than reviews uh, yeah. work yeah yeah so, i think okay okay it's true that in some in some papers okay in most of the papers uh, we both use topic coherence and topic diversity as a performance metric for measuring the like uh, how robust the model have been able to model uh, a topic but now uh, the auto actually emphasize that this topic coherence and topic diversity are just um, a kind of judgment of how similar or dissimilar a set of words are together so it, it based on a human judgment you could say okay this words is actually this set of words are actually topic coherent or they are dissimilar and whatsoever so the author in one of his email he said he he, he, he the, the next work he will want to do or he will he would like to see is actually to study these different uh, metrics because the most of them are human based and even the result that some authors present when they are doing topic modeling or topic discovery are set of coherent word and actually when you see set of coherent word you will see how oh, the model is works fine but they are actually human based so we might study uh, other ways of m measuring the performance of a topic because it is kind of still weird to say just topic coherence and topic diversity but for sure topic coherence we use we study the similarity between the word and topic diversity we study the kind of dissimilarity between the different set of topics but that should not be the only way to to measure the performance of a of a topic model okay okay and also, like when when we have a topic, let's say we, we have like we have ten thousand documents and we cluster them. We have now ten topics, like ten clusters. How do we define like the name for 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 a cluster? Mm -hmm. Because I suppose like since like there is some kind of coherence between them, there should be like a general mm -hmm. topic, like human understandable topic that defines them, other than just topic one or topic three. So how how is actually actually, actually yeah, this, that that's how they are defined. They are actually defined by topic one and topic three. But you now you need to study inside a topic. You need to see the documents or the words that have been uh, how can I say how have been modeled as being uh, the topics. So what what we do is after performing the TF IDF approach for a particular yeah. topic, we extract we extract the top K uh, TF words let's say the top 10 words of each topic so that you could oh. see okay yeah the different words that are similar or dissimilar but you won't have you won't have um a, a the name of the topic from the words that you see you could say oh this topic is uh, representative of food it's representative of religion it's representative of okay. football yeah Something so like yeah, yeah. At, at the end of the day, for example, I, I will look at uh, the top ten words of a topic, and I see like car, Toyota, Tesla, like uh, yeah. Renault, Peugeot, and I will say, yeah, this is definitely about cars. Yeah. But like, it is not like there is actually like, oh, like not in this way, but a way mm -hmm. to to just take the word and say, yeah, this is good topic for for that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but actually, there's another there's another paper. Where you can, you will not have the word, but you will have the story of the documents in the word. Like it will give you the summary of the document. Uh, uh, the paper is uh, Latin discovery, Latin uh, Latin discovery of uh, uh, topic modeling using Latin Latin discovery. Yes. Okay. Top okay. clues. 
something like that. So you could have this a summary of the words that are inside the, the topic. Okay, thank you very much again. Uh, do you have further questions? Uh, me? Um, like, the, like Mansour? No, you can't have another question because you present the paper. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can ask the question to yourself. Uh, for me, I think I'm, I'm done with my questions. Uh, okay. So if, if there are no more questions, we, we can just thank Alison uh, again. Yes, and, uh, the last question maybe what is okay. the, yes, does this model is the state of the art in document classification? What is what is the the state so, of the art that document? Is, yes, this model is the state of the art, or we can we or we have oh. another model that performs better than. Oh, okay. No, uh, I think no. We have we have a lot of model. Like I earlier said, uh, top cruise, for example, is one of the state of the art because uh, the one I uh, okay entity discovery using Latin space clustering is uh -huh. also one of the state of the art technique because. Yeah, it has been presented in NeurIPS, I think, this year. Uh, bed topic is also one of the state of the art so far. And Latin digital allocation is still one of the state of the art because most of those techniques, uh, uh, most of the ideas that we bring up now are still compared with Latin digital allocation as baseline. So, yeah, those are the, like the, the state of the art, I can say. There are most of them. So to be honest, I don't follow the paper related to NLP in this narrative <laughs> because I follow the papers related to graph and GNNs most. So that's uh, why yes, I'm lost when you talk about the trends in in NLP. But yes, I will brush up yeah. my knowledge in this field. <laughs> And I think that's that's the idea of, of having a, a ready group, right? Like, you, yeah. you, if you are an expert in graph neural networks, maybe you can help us learn about that without, without yeah. like, the effort we would have need to put if we are just alone. Mm -hmm. And, like, if Arasan is an expert in NLP, he will teach us about NLP. See? So you, you can just exchange and everybody learns. That's the... Yeah. Everybody is learning. That's the, yeah. the goal of that kind of... Um, Let's say uh, initiative. Yeah. Okay. Great. 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 So thank you, Alison, again, and uh, hey, thank you, Alison. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, yeah. Yes. Maybe like we, we are hoping that we, we can have other sessions where we'll continue discussing the so, same, uh, discussing yeah. about uh, those interesting questions that I may use in, in Kaggle competitions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no worries. <laughs> this guy is upset by Kaggle, Kaggle competition. I don't know why. I don't, don't say that. I just <laughs> want to learn. I'm obsessed by learning. That's I think, I, think, I think when we present him the next time, maybe we will say he's an obsessed of Kaggle competition. Yes, he will be, he will be <laughs> very happy to present him this year. How to be upset by, by Kaggle competition. No, Alasan, Mansur is joking only. <laughs> He's not serious. <laughs> the way so he likes competitions. Yes. I, I, I like learning, and competing yeah. is a good way to learn. So. <laughs> yes, so, so, so yeah. thank you again, so, Alasan. It's It will be a, a big pleasure to have you. And if we could have you in the future, another one. Uh, so let's say in two, three months to present me mm. paper, your, your, your paper, not, not <laughs> no. your paper, not by Arasan. <laughs> no worries. I would do that. Yes. Um, is right. we, we are waiting your own. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again. And you. so the next, uh, I think the next meeting is in two weeks. Yes. Okay. And yes, we don't know yet the, what will be the the paper or the subject. Even yeah, the, 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 the person who will present, we don't know. But yes. We, we have a calendar, but we have to decide. So true, yes. So true, there will be a presentation. So I, I'll talk with I Mansur about that. <laughs> okay. And yeah, it will be our pleasure to, to have you as, a, as an attendee. 
where okay. you can contribute sure, sure. With your questions and everything. Okay, so I'm sure. going to stop the recording and thank you again, Alpha. Yeah, welcome.